the whole position is absurd and imagined. I mean, I'm not, I'm arguing a very specific thing about Jay, transcendentals in this The world. machine I'm talking to you about are human beings. It's not an absurd world. The world I'm talking about That's a is paradigm the world. assumption that you think humans are merely biological machines. Yep. Do you uh, have evidence you, that I'm made of anything else book. than an atom, than a set of molecules? This is you ridiculous. You believe you wrote your book. So your book was the work of JF and JF's mind, right? It wasn't the process of a determined machine, right? It was the process of a determined machine. It was the so, process so you of didn't the neurons have in idea. my mind. You didn't have, and you're not making your own arguments right now. They're just a chemical determined process. Absolutely. So you're not making arguments. Thank you. I've won the debate. All right. Bye. The scientific method cannot justify the scientific method. Therefore, it itself is a dogmatic religious presupposition. Okay. Well, I look forward to it. I heard your debate with uh, Nicholas Fuentes, and I, I thought that was very entertaining. And um, so I, I respect your debate skills, that's for sure. Well, thank you. I've yet to lose a debate, actually. <laughs> <laughs>
shadow global government is already here. And as we said, it's in the latter stages of the mopping up process to move it into the next phase, i.e. between two pages of the next page. All right, <clears throat> welcome. Today we get into the mix. It's time to put the nail in the coffin for the Thomists. You know, the Thomists have really gotten on my nerves. And it's not because they got under my skin, it's because they don't listen. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the final nail in the coffin for the last refuge that they have, which is this absurd objection well, actually, there's a series of absurd objections that relate primarily to things like apologetics, the source of argumentation, the five ways, God is pure act, uh, what does it mean to be simple, what does it mean to be composed, are creatures a composite of essence and existence, and therefore God is not a composite of essence and existence, and therefore simple, and that's how we know that there had to be a first simple cause. We're going to go through all this <clears throat> And we're not going to leave them any refuge to fall back on. We're going to demonstrate that there is a difference in the approach between Maximus and John of Damascus in terms of Aristotle and the way Aquinas and Roman Catholicism uses it. We're going to be looking at the 200 chapters of Maximus. We're going to be looking at the Ambigua. They haven't even touched these. They don't know anything about St. Maximus. They have no clue. Guys that have been studying theology for two years and they're calling me idiot. They're calling me a retard. I've been doing this for 20 years. Don't you think I know a little bit about epistemology? Don't you think if you've even done a basic philosophy grad class, you would know some of the, the ideas and things that I talk about? Don't you think I know a little bit about this after 20 years? But no, the, not only are they just completely arrogant, they're completely ignorant. It's literal Thomist Dunning-Kruger. Dumb Ox Kruger. The Dumb Ox Kruger effect is what we're talking about here. So what we're going to talk about first is the five ways. We're going to talk about a lot tonight. And they're not even going to be in the debate. The guys responding to me, they're not even in the debate. They don't even know what the issue was. I posted the Fesser article about Scotism. They don't even know why I posted it. They don't even know what a, what a formal distinction is. Stuff that I studied 10, 20 years ago. I was doing graduate work on Aristotle 10 years ago. Don't you think I have some conception of these things? But no, they just act like demons. They act like literal demons, and they're going to get crushed tonight. We're going to crush the Thomas. And, and I enjoy it because the more that they do this, the more I crush them and the more converts we make. So let's start by talking about um, the five ways we're, we're going to talk about the starting point of our theology. This is one area where we differ. We don't start in our theology, typically speaking, with abstract philosophical speculation. And the first place that we can see that is the difference of approach in the way that John Damascus approaches these questions. Now, I did a talk three, almost four years ago on the fount of knowledge where I went through and I covered every specific way in the fount of knowledge in which John Damascus uses Aristotle in the proper way. Now, Methoma and classical atheists continue to lie and act like I'm attacking Aristotle and I don't even have any conception of the fact that the Eastern Fathers use Aristotle, even though I've sent them that, S that, that lecture from four years ago, which has had like 15, 20,000 views. They didn't watch it. They don't care. They don't pay attention because they're not honest. And that's why they're hurting. That's why they're losing their people. When John of Damascus begins his work on the exposition of the Orthodox faith, let's notice the difference in the Ordo Theologiae between this and Aquinas. When Aquinas begins the Summa, he talks about the approach and methodology of theology. Is it a science or is it different from a science? And he goes into us to saying that, well, it's, it's kind of both, but ultimately it's the hand, uh, theology uh, is the queen of science and philosophy is the handmaiden 
of theology. And that's that in itself is not a problem. The problem is that when he begins to, whether it's the Summa Contra Gentiles, the way he begins the work by speculating about the generic theism, the first cause, or whether it's the argumentation about the, the simplicity of God, the existence of God and God is pure act within the first few questions of the Summa, it's different than the approach of John Damascus because they have a different perspective. And that's what we're going to be highlighting today. And this is ultimately going to lead us to, number one, why the five ways don't work, why there are philosophical problems, and ultimately why the transcendental argument is a better argument. And the fact that all of those classical arguments can be reformulated as transcendental arguments to make them valid. Now, again, these people don't know what they're talking about. They haven't spent 20 years studying epistemology and doing this kind of argument. I've been working in transcendental arguments for 20 years. I know what I'm talking about. How does John of Damascus begin the book? Does he begin with abstract speculations about the first move, uh, unmoved mover? No, he begins by talking about God, not seeing God, apophatic theology, and the Father and the Trinity. He begins with the triad. That's the beginning of this work. That is a different ordo theologiae from what would become the norm in the late medieval and early medieval Latin West. Excuse me, in the early medieval and then late, late medieval West, uh, coming to fruition right about, you could say, the time of Aquinas. And then into Trent and then into Vatican I, where you have the final codification of classical foundationalism uh, throughout the statements of Vatican I in terms of epistemology. The epistemological approach of the apologetic in Vatican I is obviously classical foundationalism. Now, um, John Damascus does go on to talk about Romans 1. He talks about Wisdom 13.5. He talks about the continuity between the Old and New Testament, providence, and tradition. So he begins his theology with revelation. Do you see this difference? This is a different order of theology, and this is one of the key matters where for a long time Orthodox theologians have been arguing against the Thomistic and Latin perspective. Not because the, it doesn't matter temporally or logically where you start your theology. The issue is the metaphysical priority, you see. This is a problem. This is an issue in philosophy. Basil actually discusses this in his letters where he talks about mistaking logical and epistemological priority for metaphysical priority. So in other words, because, for example, a lot of Thomists, they'll begin their theology and they'll talk about five ways. They'll talk about remotion. They'll talk about uh, causality. They'll talk about teleology. And they'll think that because the, a lot of people have converted or because we're starting in the, in the temporal process of our reasoning from that point, that therefore those principles, teleology, causality, etc., efficient causality, they have then some metaphysical primacy or certitude that other types of things don't have, right? Namely, the existence of God. So the assumption of the Thomists and all the classical foundationalists is that you can't objectively, definitively pr prove with certainty the existence of God. That's ultimately a matter of faith, but you can show with rational certitude to a degree that a God exists, and then later on you can tack on with probability that that God is a trinity or Jesus. This is totally the methodology of, I've read the Summa Contra Gentiles. This is how he begins. The entire book one is about demonstrating a common generic theism. And once you've demonstrated the common generic theism through natural theology, you then tack on top of that arguments from Revelation, arguments uh, about the personhood of Christ and so forth. Because those are revealed truths and they're distinct. They're a, a tier below supernatural truths, right? Everybody knows this. Nature and supernature, nature and grace, these are the basic, fundamental, two-tiered system of Thomism. Now, we don't see that in the beginning of St. John of Damascus' approach. He begins in a different place from Aquinas. He begins with revealed theology. He then moves into the doctrine of inspiration. He, he moves into the doctrine of revealed theology showing us a personal God. The first cause that he talks about after discussing the starting point of revelation, revealed theology, there is a first cause, yeah. And that first cause is a personal God, a he. Guess who else said that? Maximus the Confessor. Maximus does not teach natural theology. Does Maximus at times say natural law? Of course. And what all these dumb Thomists did was assume the word concept fallacy, as if because the terminology is the same, that the meanings and the theology are all the same. That's a basic level, basic bitch mistake when it comes to philosophy and theology. There's different terminology in different contexts. The word logos doesn't mean the same thing in Marcus Aurelius as it does in John 1. Obviously, because in John 1, it's Jesus. 
Marcus Aurelius doesn't mean Jesus, right? Hypostasis in Plotinus doesn't mean the same thing as hypostasis in the New Testament, obviously. So much of Roman Catholicism's confusion and Thomism in terms of its confusion is over terminological equivalence in the word concept fallacy. There have been many theologians, well known, not just me. I'm, I'm merely echoing what the top 20th century theologians in the Orthodox Church have said. They're calling it neo palamism It's just a restatement of what we've been saying the whole time. It's what Lasky says. It's what Florovsky says. It's what Father Stein Eloy says. It's what Yanaro says. All these very well-known Orthodox theologians all explicating all these things that I say. Before Pharrell, they were saying all this before Pharrell wrote God History Dialectic. So they have all these ad hominems and all these, these against the man attacks where they say that, that oh, you're just following Pharrell. Oh, you're, you're, you invented all this stuff. No, I'm just literally reciting what Florovsky says what Lasky says. And I demonstrate that in all the talks, if you would actually just listen to the talks that I've done, but you can't do that. You're all too low IQ. It's the Dalmox Kruger effect when it comes to the Thomas. And I know because I've been there, I've been a hardcore Thomist who wouldn't listen to correction. And I was arrogant. I thought I knew it all and I didn't know it all. Now, when it comes to John Damascus, we want to point out the first point, which is that John Damascus uses a transcendental argument. And this contradicts both Methoma and Dr. Malpass, because Dr. Malpass argued that nobody saw uh, a transcendental argument in Aristotle's Metaphysics 7 until, I don't know what he thinks, later philosophers, and so he wrote some essay trying to show that it's not a transcendental argument. Well, okay, uh, I don't really ultimately care what you think about Aristotle and his transcendental argument, because... I can show you that John Damascus thought that Aristotle in Book 7 was giving a transcendental argument. So let me show you this first. This is going to be one of our starting points to once again show there is no anywhere in Aquinas a transcendental argument. It's not possible in that epistemology. Because it is essentially, and this is an anachronism, this, it is a classical foundationalist epistemology. I know that they didn't use the terminology classical foundationalism in his day. That's a later post-enlightenment terminology. But it's the same idea, so it doesn't matter. Don't get hung up on the stupid terms. What matters is the meaning of the terms. So here we see uh, in the Fount of Knowledge, John Damascus says, there are some who have endeavored to do away with philosophy entirely saying that it doesn't exist. He's talking about the sophists. These are the sophists that Aristotle in Book 7 of Metaphysics is replying to. How is it that you, they will answer, we will answer them by saying, how is it that, that you say there is neither philosophy nor knowledge nor perception? Is it by your knowing and perceiving it or by your not knowing and perceiving it? If you have perceived it, well, that is knowledge and perception. But if it is by your not knowing it, then no one will believe you as long as you're discussing something of which you have no knowledge. Since, therefore, there is such a thing as philosophy, and since that there is knowledge of things that are, let us talk about being. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm about to delete this stupid Thomist in the chat because, I mean, these people come into the chat and they don't even know what they're talking about. They say, oh, will you please debate my big brother? Please debate Dr. Jared Goth. Please debate Edward Fesser. Uh, 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 I won't debate you, but, but please debate my big brother. Uh, uh. Yeah, I, I'm talking about natural revelation, dude. That's not natural theology. Maximus teaches natural revelation, not natural theology. And if you knew what the Logos Logi doctrine was, you would know that because he goes to great length to discuss it in the ambiguum. You idiot, Louis the Ninth, 11th of France. You're a moron. You don't know what you're talking about. You're out of here. Thomists are dying out. You're losing. You're a bunch of losers. Get gone, bro. They don't even know what a transcendental argument is. How, if they're teaching the same thing between John Damascus and Thomas Aquinas, how is it that John Damascus does a transcendental argument and Thomas never does? That's because they don't teach the same thing, dummies. Since then, there is, no, there is such a thing as a philosophy, and since there is a knowledge of the things that are, let us talk about being. However, one should understand that we are beginning 
with that division of philosophy, which concerns reason, which is a tool of philosophy rather than one of its divisions, because it is used for every demonstration. So for the present, we shall discuss simple terms, which through simple concepts signify simple things. Then after we have explained the meanings of the words, we shall investigate dialectic. So the beginning of Fount of Knowledge, you see uh, a very clear presentation against sophists. Again, this is Aristotle does this in book seven of the metaphysics, where he argues against the sophists by saying through reductio, uh, if you deny the laws of logic, you assume them in arguing against them, and that's a transcendental argument. Now, these dummies don't even know what a transcendental argument is, and they say, that's not one. It is one. It is. Go look it up. Go look up the Stanford Philosophy Encyclopedia, and the first citation will be Aristotle's metaphysics. Now, ultimately, I don't care whether Aristotle did or didn't. I, I, it's not ultimately dependent upon Aristotle. But I'm just saying these idiots are so hard-headed and they don't listen. And here, John of Damascus is doing a transcendental argument. And he thought, obviously, that's from Book 7 of Metaphysics. That's what, Arist that's what John of Damascus thought Aristotle was saying. So that also disproves Malpass, who says that this was all cooked up and, and nobody before the modern era or whatever thought that uh, Aristotle was doing a transcendental argument. It doesn't have to use the name transcendental argument if it's the same form of argumentation. Don't be an anachronistic moron. The terms aren't what matters. The meaning is what matters. That's what St. Jerome says about translations, and he's right about all this stuff. Now, <clears throat> I'm not saying terms never matter. I'm just saying that ultimately what matters is the meaning of the terms. All these papal lawyers. Um, so we're starting with this idea. We're starting with the different ordo theologic. Orthodoxy has a different order of theology from both Protestantism and Thomism slash Roman Catholicism. And we, we point that out because most of the time the critics, the people that are objecting to it, fall into thinking, and because they're trapped in either or dialectics all the time, they fall into thinking that you are saying what Calvinists say. Uh, uh, because I don't understand what you're saying, uh, and because I remember one time I heard that Bonson and Van Til said this, you are just a Calvinist. Nice genetic fallacy, dude. As if the source of an argument had anything to do with the, with the truth or falsity or validity of the argument. Did you not just listen to me say that Aristotle did a transcendental argument? Right. Do I agree with Aristotle on every topic? No. Do I think that Aristotle is wrong on every topic? No. So let's be more nuanced and not be retards here, okay? So the source of an argument has nothing to do with its validity. That's why it's not a genetic fallacy. I can say Aristotle got things right. I can say Aristotle got things wrong. It doesn't hurt my theology. I can say Bonson got things right. I can say Bonson got things wrong. It's not an either or. It's not a holistic thing. It's very nuanced and it's very clear. Now, I've been putting out for years talks and recommendations on all these topics and all the objections that these guys are putting up, all these Thomas, they're objections I've answered for years. And when I send them the objections, they don't care. They don't listen, right? That's the problem. Now, let's talk about one specific point uh, after we talk about the fact that our ordo theology is not Calvinism. Uh, it's not uh, Thomism, right? So it's not uh, an elogia fide, which is the Calvinist order of theology, the Calvinist epistemology, where you only know what's supposedly revealed in Scripture, which is impossible because of the doctrine of total depravity. The noetic effects of sin and Calvinism are affecting you such, to such an extent that you could never explicitly or certainly know anything in Scripture uh, with certitude because they have such a radical and absurd doctrine of total depravity. Secondly, when it comes to Thomism, we don't believe in the analogia entis. All right? Now, again, I know it's hard for the low IQ Thomists out there to, to read books other than the summa, the, the summas that they actually haven't read because they're actually just figuring this stuff out, right? They're like, pe guys that are two years into Thomism and think they've mastered it, trying to debate people that have spent 10, 20 years in it. Uh, there's a really good book by Yaroslav Pelikan. Okay, and he's going to, if you read this book, he will give you a profound and in depth introduction to how Christianity in the ancient world encountered and dealt with the challenges of Hellenism. So what you've heard me talking about that you just laugh at and deride, it's all in normal scholarship on these topics, right? I've read all of Pelican series. I've read the whole five volume set of the Christian tradition. 
And I've also read this. I read it 10 years ago. Now, what I would say is that if you guys really want to know what's going on, I, you should listen to the recommendations I've given you. And what you'll get in this book is a, an accurate presentation, an overview of the nuances of how those early Eastern fathers principally, I mean, he does talk about Western fathers too, but mainly because of the preeminence of the Eastern fathers in triadology and Christology, he talks about their encounter with Hellenism and classical culture. So it has nothing to do with constantly referring to Dr. Farrell. By the way, God, History, and Dialectic is a great book. It's a great series summarizing the early church fathers' encounter with Hellenism and dialectics. This is another one, okay? So when Pelican begins the book, he starts by talking about the different approaches. He talks about the importance of revelation. He talks about um, how the church fathers in the East did not see a disjunction between faith and reason, okay? So right there we know that we're not doing fideism, we're not doing uh, no apologetics, right? This is, this is coming from the quarters of pietism, the quarters of so-called orthodoxy who say don't do polemics and don't do apologetics. No, actually you're completely out of, out of line with the entire early uh, first eight centuries of church fathers. They all do apologetics, they all do polemics. And Pelican shows that very clearly within the first few chapters. Now, I'm not citing Pelican because I'm telling you not to actually read those, those church fathers. I have read them all. I've read all the orations. I've read Basil's letters. Uh, I've read Nyssa against Eunomius. I've read Basil against Eunomius. I've read Athanasius at length. I've read uh, catechetical lectures. Uh, I've read the Eastern Fathers in depth, right? Maximus, John Damascus, right? I'm not telling you not to read them. I'm just saying that a lot of the people who are engaging in this debate who don't even know what they're talking about could benefit from reading a few secondary sources that are not Thomists, right? Pelican eventually, I believe, converted to Orthodoxy. He was a Lutheran for a long time and ended up Orthodox. And you'll see that he has a very in-depth and nuanced approach to the Eastern Fathers. And he actually explicates in here, as all the other people that I talk about do, the difference between the Thomistic approach to natural theology Hellenism, etc., and the, the approach of the Eastern Fathers. Now, uh, against the to against the Calvinists, we want to point out that uh, so we do do apologetics against the Phaedius, but against the Calvinists, we want to point out that we don't believe that man is so fallen that he can't ever reason properly or that he can't do uh, virtuous things right without so-called, as they call it, uh, common grace. Man can still do those things because he still retains the image of God. And this is where we disagree with the Calvinists is over the extent of the doctrine of the fall. So, again, I'm stressing that the Orthodox view is neither Calvinist nor Roman Catholic or Thomist. It's not Scotist either, by the way. Natural theology in the conception of the Eastern Fathers, according to Pelican, is ultimately not just... Uh, a speculative philosophical exercise, but it's an apologetic approach. And we would agree with that, right? Because when Maximus goes to great lengths to, to explain and explicate what he means by natural theology and natural law, he actually says it's Jesus, you see. So it's teaching the logi. That's what's going to be so key here. Thomistic theology does not and cannot have a doctrine of the logi, right? That's crucial. That's the big difference here. When we read Father Staniloi, that's how he begins the first few pages of the book, is by pointing out how and why we don't have natural theology. We're going to go into all, by the way, the specific five arguments in five ways. I'm just trying to help you guys out and point you in the direction of things that would help you understand our position. Even if you don't come to the same conclusions of, of what we, we say, it would at least help you not to make dumbass arguments and stupid arguments and reply to things that I never said and make up straw men and not even understand what we're saying. Wouldn't you want to at least understand the position instead of just these dishonest characterizations? Pelican writes that the complex interactions of this natural theology as an apologetic uh, is a presupposition. For in these classical systems, natural theology tended to present itself as an alternative to the cultic practices and paganism of their day. The traditional religious observances, right, in the pagan Roman Empire he's talking about, its principal expositors, expositors 
were not the official spokesmen for traditional observance, nor the priests of the cult, but by lay philosophers and apologists. And there he talks about the Cappadocians. But when we start to understand what is meant by natural theology, it's not exactly what the Thomist thinks, is it? Because we're going to start immediately getting into the doctrine of revelation. I just showed you that John of Damascus begins his book with revelation. The next chapter of Pelican is about negation, apophatic and cataphatic theology. Now, when he goes into explaining the Eastern Fathers' usage of apophatic theology, and when he talks about analogia, this is on pages 43 to 44, he talks about the logos, and not just the logos, but the logi in creation. That is the uncreated logi that are in creation, and their energies. For us, there is an analogia. Let's get this, this clear. Maybe I can help uh, our, our slower audience out here that are the Thomists. Even though I've already done this in talks, which they don't listen to. And I'm sure that some uh, Orthodox people will fuss because they don't understand what we're talking about either. But just to make this a little clearer for you. Analogia entis, right, the analogy of being, this is the Thomistic scheme, whereby we reason up from creatures, created things, to the divine essence, to that first simple uh, non-composite pure act cause of all things, which is God, right? Analogia fide, that is the analogy of faith. That's the Calvinist Protestant classical Reformation doctrine that the only things that we can know are about God are the things that are told to us in the text of Scripture. Of course, again, with the Reformed doctrine of the fall and total depravity, analogia fide doesn't work because the noetic effects of sin are such that man's reasoning capacity cannot even reason properly about Scripture itself. So it's self-defeating to have the doctrine of total depravity at the same time as having the doctrine of the analogia fide. For us, you could say there is an analogia energeia, right? Basil says that we do know God on the basis of the energies that come down to us and not his essence. This is letter 234. Basil is very clear in letter 234 that it's not the analogia, analogia entis. It's the analogia energeia. And how do we do that? What's the different anthropological faculty that orthodoxy possesses in its dogmas that none of these other two possess? The doctrine of the noose. All right. The doctrine of the noose is the innermost heart. This, we believe, is the faculty that God gave man to know him directly. As a result of the fall, however, man's noose is clouded by sins and passions. So therefore, the exercise of theosis, in part, is subjecting the intellect ratiocinations, not destroying them, but subjecting them to the heart, the inner man. This is logotherapy in the truest sense. Okay, This is the process of theosis. It is not putting the intellect above the heart, but putting the heart in unison and superior to intellect. We must repent in our intellect for the intellect to operate in its proper mode and sense. And again, this is one of the mistakes uh, that the hyper-spiritual so-called Orthodox make is that they think this means, oh, that means you don't do apologetics. Uh, excuse me, uh, Palamas, the, the great expositor of this, did apologetics. Of course he did. Maximus did apologetics. So the way this works is that these things need to be in their proper ordering. In Orthodox praxis and theology. And that, that's when you repent, this is this is the, the ordering of your hierarchy of your, your faculties. These two are in harmony, but this is prior because you have to repent before you can properly interpret the world. Does that mean that we don't do apologetics because nobody can properly interpret the world until they repent? No, we do apologetics so that they do repent. We can become a co-worker with God, as Paul says, to bring people to repentance. Now, ultimately, that's between God and them. 
We don't cause that. We can't make that happen. But Paul is very clear that we are co-workers with Christ in these efforts to convert people. Now, in Romans 1, Paul is very clear that man's heart is darkened, you see. Paul doesn't say that uh, man just needs to straighten out his intellectual capacities and reasoning back to a first cause in Romans 1. No, 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 no. Man's problem is not philosophic speculation and reasoning. It's his heart. He needs to repent. That's what Paul says in Romans 1. There's nothing in Romans 1 about remotion, about philosophic speculation and descriptive processes back to a first cause. Is there a first cause? Yeah. But that first cause is God the Father, the Trinity, Jesus. That's the first cause. Not a series of causation and causal chains back to a supernatural first cause. We reason from natural causes back to a supernatural, which is an invalid leap in logic. By the way, it's a non sequitur, as I'll show you in a second. But we want to understand that this is a different anthropology that we have. They have no idea what you're talking about in Roman Catholic ecclesiology or anthropology or theology. When you talk about the news, they're like, what are you talking about? There's only body and intellect. That's all man is. That's not what we believe. Paul says body, soul, spirit. Tripartite. Now, does this mean that the body is evil and doesn't matter? No, they're not in dialectics, dummies. They're not either ors. It's just a hierarchy of things. It's like the hierarchy of what matters most in your life. God matters most and then your loved ones, right? Does that mean that you hate your loved ones because God is at the top of the... No, that's stupid, right? It's not either or, it's both and. So let's begin by ceasing to think in these dumb dialectics of either or. Because that's, by the way, going to be the main problem for all of the Thomists, especially the ones that I've argued with more recently in the last few weeks, who uh, only think that there's two possibilities. Either God is composed of accident and substance, or he's absolutely simple. That's the only two options in their mind. And we're going to see that that's actually a wrong false dialectic. That's why John Damascus does not conceive of God as composed of accident and substance, and yet at the same time he thinks the uncreated energies are uncreated energies because they're not the same thing as accidents in God. So when, a, when the Thomists go to John Damascus, they say, look, John Damascus says God's not composed of substance and accident. Therefore, uh, he teaches what we teach. No, dummy, read the rest of the book. Because in book one, all the way to book three, he consistently argues for uncreated energies being distinct. <laughs> You're ignoring the whole book. And taking out of context the fact that he says, and by the way, we believe that. We don't think God is composed of substance and accident. And guess what? Newsflash, uncreated energies aren't accidents. I don't mean an accident in the sense of a wreck. I mean accident in the substance accident scheme of Aristotle. And by the way, guess what? When we get to, John, uh, to Maximus, Maximus says that God is first cause, but he's also not first cause. Because God is first cause as it relates to creation. But as it relates to God from all eternity, theology proper, we can't use any of those terms about God. God as cause, sustaining uh, uh, agent, and final cause, he says only apply to God in relation to creation in terms of the energies. They don't apply to God as he is. They're, God is not a first principle. He begins the book rejecting the Thomistic scheme. It's everything that I keep telling you guys, but you don't listen. And instead of listening, you just want to be arrogant. There is an analogia, and these analogia are the terms and names that we use, the divine names. If you read the divine names, uh, Dionysius is very clear that at the beginning that the names that we use of God are about his energies. They have nothing to do with God's essence. They are his energies. The energies of God are not identical to the divine essence. If they were identical to the divine essence, it would lead to absurdity, as Basil says in Luke letter 234. You would, you would literally be saying that foreknowledge is identical to love, is identical to mercy. Now, the Thomists say, yeah, but we don't say that. Uh, you're not honest with Aquinas because he makes a distinction between the attributes. I know that. I've said that all along. The distinction is virtual, conceptual, logical, nominal. 
Those are the terms that all the Thomists ever have used for what the distinctions between the attributes are. And guess what? None of those are real. They're all a denial explicitly of real distinctions. Virtual, conceptual, logical, nominal. The standard Thomistic 101 terminology and explanation. Uh, and by the way, in at the beginning of um, the section in the in the Summa, where uh, as I'll show, we'll look at it here in a minute, where Aquinas actually talks about the distinction. He says they're merely an intellectual distinction. So his terminology uh, in the Summa explicitly is a human intellectual distinction, not a real distinction. So the distinction between love and foreknowledge that you think you see about God, that's only a human conceptual distinction. It's not a real distinction in God because real distinctions in God, according to Thomism, would lead to composition. You can't have composition because God's absolutely simple. It's that easy. All right. The argument is not that Thomas doesn't say right things. How many times do I have to say this? All the Thomas do is they go and they find, look over here in this other place, Thomas says something accurate. He says what you're saying. The argument is, is that he says two different things. Do you not understand what a contradiction is? If I say one thing here, and then over here I say the complete wrong, different thing. One of those could be correct, but it doesn't comport with the other thing. That's what a contradiction is. Now, uh, as Pelican progresses through the beginning of the book, in page, on pages 54 to 55, he actually gets into discussing the energies. The energies are one and many at the same time, and that's not a dialectical problem. God is wholly present in every energy, and yet at the same time, he's distinct in every one of those energies. Now, to the Thomas, that sounds like a contradiction, because they, they believe, on the basis of a presupposition, which they've never questioned, that all distinctions that are real imply composition and division. We simply reject that. And that's not even taught in Dionysius. If you read Dionysius on the divine names, he says that God transcends the logical categories of either or like that. God transcends the category of substance and accident. That's what Maximus says at the beginning of 200 chapters. God transcends the categories of any name that you apply to him. That's the whole point of the divine names. Just read it. And he specifically uses the energies twice in the divine names. And then later talks about them as the divine rays that come down to us in creation. They're not created effects. They're actual divine rays, the uncreated light. There's no created light that is God. God is not a creature. And that's what even Pelican says here. Next, we want to talk about again. Now, go watch the talk that I did years ago where I talked about the fount of knowledge. In fact, maybe I should just link that for you people. Low IQ, low IQ Thomas. I thought I deleted this jerk. Is he still in here? Oh, the chat's just behind. It's having to catch up. Okay, so I did a whole talk on the basic metaphysical concepts from the fount of knowledge almost four years ago. Here is that talk. By the way, you can support with Super Chats. Uh, Super Chats are always welcome. 239 nerds, welcome everybody. As we work through, we're just getting started. Hold on, hold your buckle up. We're just getting started. As I go through in that uh, lecture, you'll want to be familiar with these terms in Eastern theology. Arche, monarchia, right? We speak of God the Father as the Arche of the Godhead, the first cause, the ungenerate one, right? That's the person of the Father. It's not the substance of the Godhead. We speak of telos, right? God is purpose. God is the purpose of all creatures. We have no problem using these terms. These are terms that both Aristotle and the Eastern Fathers and sometimes Scripture use, right? Energeia. Inner gay is a term that's used in the Bible, in the New Testament, in Paul's epistles, and in Aristotle. Did you know Aristotle made a distinction between essence and energy? Isn't it funny how the Thomists don't read Bradshaw's book on this? When this whole book is about that? It's like 
dealing with a bunch of kids. Aristotle, East and West. Very well-known book. Not hard to get a hold of. By Dr. Bradshaw. And what Bradshaw is doing is saying, look, there's two different metaphysics between the East and the West. Uh, and ultimately goes back to two different views of Aristotle. Now, if classical atheist and Methelma had listened to what I've been saying for two or three years, they would know that I said this all along. I never said Aristotle is wrong on everything. I never said we don't listen to Aristotle. I said we have two different views of Aristotle because I read this book 10 years ago. They haven't even read it. They don't know anything about the topic. They're new to the topic. And just being D-bags. That book is a great scholarly introduction to the different approaches to Aristotle between East and West. How many times do I have to sit? These people just won't read this stuff, right? This is yet another book that deals with the same topic. Standard scholarship. So we want to be familiar with the idea of uh, Arche, Telos, Apophasis, right? We know that. A lot of these guys want to. Energeia, Tropos or Tropoi, that comes into play with Christology quite a bit, right? How does nature exist? It exists in the tropos or the mode of hypostasis. And that's what in hypostatize means. That becomes a very important term in St. Cyril's Christology. We want to know about Sophia. Sophia is the presence of beauty within creation. It's not a separate hypostasis. We're not Gnostics. But it is a, terminal, uh, a terminological uh, idea. It's a term that the Eastern Fathers use. So it does help to know uh, the terms of the Eastern Fathers. Um, and I've, I'm just listing some of those. And if you want a more fleshed out lecture where I go into the explicating of those terms, I was just tutoring somebody yesterday, actually, in fact, who said, I've been studying this now for two years, a guy who just converted to uh, Russian Orthodoxy from Roman Catholicism. He said, Jay, it took me uh, about a year or two before I went through your concepts from the basic metaphysics talk and understood what you were getting at. And when I finally read through John of Damascus, uh, he said, I got it. But I didn't get it until I understood the terminological categories and usages from the fount of knowledge. Correct. Again, Thomists, I've been lecturing on the fount of knowledge and the usage of Aristotle for years. So you're just making idiots of yourselves by saying that I don't accept Aristotle. It's not about Aristotle, ultimately. It's about what's revealed. And it's about where Aristotle's right and Aristotle's wrong. The father is the arche. This is one beginning point where we differ from the Thomistic approach. Now, ultimately, the Vatican Clarification of the Filioque admits, yes, Latin theology got imbalanced with this, and the father is the principal source and cause of the Godhead. But you remember when I debated Dr. Feingold, he didn't even know what that meant. He'd never even heard that. The Father is the cause, the Arche, the Godhead. He's like, God doesn't have any causality in his inter-Trinitarian relationships. Totally lost on normative, Eastern, patristic, first millennium Christology and triadology. Next we get into discussions of uh, how the analogia entis is different from essence and energies. This is pages 68 to 69. Sophia and beauty in creation, 71. And the reason I wanted to talk about this was the interesting statement from Pelican that when the church fathers in their apologetic, he says, he's talking about, Discuss polytheism, atheism, syncretism, dualism, pantheism. Uh, what is left is a, as a reasonable and acceptable view of the divine. Only monotheism, in the sense of a personal God, is what's left. Right now, we've covered that many times when I did the talk on uh, Athanasius against the heathen. Right, uh, when we look at the way Basil, for example. Uh, responded to this is in the other lectures i shouldn't have to keep repeating this when he responds to the objection of plotinus about what the one is the i am and he says it's a he not an it right and 
what's interesting is that Pelican moves on to, to point out that the apophatic theology, the essence synergy distinction that is so crucial to the Eastern Fathers in refuting Hellenism is, is necessary to demonstrate that the God of Christianity is the personal God of the Father. Exactly. He's saying what I've been saying to you. One of the, and then he begins to talk about the unique aspects of revealed theology that we get here. And not just revealed theology, but a revealed anthropology. That's what, that was the whole point of my lecture three and a half, four years ago on Fount of Knowledge. Creation ex nihilo is not demonstrable in the Thomistic view. But creation ex nihilo is revealed, right? It's revealed theology. But apophatic theology was specifically invoked at length to refute Plato and the Timaeus and the eternality of creation. Keep that in mind. The Platonic doctrine of the eternality of creation. And what did the Eastern Fathers do to disprove that? Well, they went into apophatic theology and the essence energy distinction. I'm going to show you that for Maximus. The, the Thomists don't even know about this. They don't know why originism is the basis for the beatific vision. They're idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know that the essence energy distinction was invoked from this time to refute the forms that forms are in the essence of the monad or God. They're uncreated energies. That's what the forms are. They're logi. The whole argumentation of Maximus and multiple ambiguous is to refute that the forms of things are identical to the monad. They're uncreated energies. Maximus is very explicit about that. Nobody even de debates that. These people don't know what they're talking. They've never read this stuff. They haven't picked up any Maximus. One of them the other day said, oh, I just started Maximus. I've been reading Maximus for 10 years and the guy's trying to debate me. Mauritian struggle. More like Mauritian struggles with basic concepts. Now, uh, Pelican moves on to talk about how mathematics and logic and telos in nature are connected. Uh-oh, get this. To what? To the Logi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, Dom Damascus talks about the Logi too, by the way. It's not just Maximus that discusses this at length. So the only reason we went into that long kind of... It's getting dark in here. Escapade was to show that the stuff that I talk about is normative in these orthodox theological works. I'm not just making this stuff up. It's not neo palamism It's standard in orthodox theological works. It's standard in Lasky. It's standard in Pelican. It's standard in Staniloi. It's standard in Florovsky. They're not saying new things. They're just simply saying what we've always said. Let's get to the natural theological step-by-step -step arguments. Now, remember that in Romans 1, Paul's not saying, he's not talking about a, 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 a strung out philosophic speculation. He's talking about man's heart being darkened and man being guilty, right? Man being in a state where he has no excuse. Paul actually says in Romans 1, they don't have, there's not an excuse. Now, if man's autonomous natural reasoning just needed to be corrected and that there was a lack of evidence, then he would have an excuse, right? Namely, he hadn't read Aristotle, right? I mean, that's how stupid this is, right? As if Romans 1 is about the five ways of Aristotle. Oh, well, if you just reason properly the five, if you read Aristotle's metaphysics and figure all that out, then you would understand that there has to be a God and then you wouldn't be held accountable. That's not what Paul says. Paul says that humans suppress the truth in unrighteousness in the darkness of their hearts, their noose. Two different things. Paul is not, why doesn't Paul do the five ways if that's what that was about? That's literally how the Thomists exegete Romans 1. It's so dumb. That has nothing to do with Aristotle's proofs. It's a, it's a statement about natural revelation, not natural theology. And the Thomists just all read that into it. 
All right. The next point we want to make about the ancient and medieval world what, it deals with the fact that they didn't think in meta level categories. They didn't do that kind of philosophy. Now, there were intimations of this, as we said, book seven of Aristotle's Metaphysics, John of Damascus, right, doing a transcendental argument for God, right? And, of course, Father Schuping has the book about the neopatristic presuppositionalism of St. Irenaeus, right? Uh, I'm working with a uh, Father Deacon now. We're going to be presenting a book on this topic. But you have to understand that in the process of philosophy, Questions are asked down the road after a development of ideas that weren't asked in the ancient and medieval world. For example, let's just set, so show the stupidity of this stupid of this idea. We could just say, look, does it does it follow that because computers were not invented in the ancient world, that the truths behind the propositions, the calculations behind the invention of the computer weren't true in the ancient and medieval world? No. Obviously, that's dumb, right? They just simply did not think that way yet. And in the same way, nobody had done, for example, linguistic philosophy in the ancient medieval world. There were intimations of that, right? Aristotle talking about poetics and this kind of stuff. But they didn't think about transcendental categories because people had not asked questions at that level yet. They didn't ask paradigmatic level questions yet. There's intimations of it. But what happens is that the ancient and medieval world move away from the notion of stable metaphysics into solipsism, into empiricism, these ideas that had seeds and intimations in the ancient world but were not yet brought to full fruition. This is why anybody who goes and learns philosophy learns the history of philosophy because you can't understand more recent ideas without understanding the ideas that came before them. It's just part of the nature of the process of how we learn things. And there's an ideological dialogue in the history of Western philosophy that's going on from the time of the ancient Greeks and even further back to the Indo-Aryans, the Vedas, um, Egyptian Hermetica, this kind of stuff, into the time of the Greeks and into the Romans and into the church fathers. There's a, there's a process to this, right? So you kind of have to be familiar to some degree with the scope as a whole. Now, I'm, I am familiar with this, right? I've been doing this for 20 years. I've studied at the graduate level. So I know what I'm talking about. Doesn't mean I know everything, but for guys that are 18, 19, 20 to act like just total douchebags and, and talk to, you know, just go after people's character is just embarrassing. It's ridiculous. You need to be familiar with the dialogue that's been going on in the history of the West for 2,000 years and more. And you can't possibly do that within two years of just coming out of atheism, right? You're 20 years old. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know when you're 20. You don't have the capabilities to have put the time and the effort into all of these years of not just the primary sources, but also secondary sources. And as you get older, you're going to see that I'm right about that. Don't you think I made these same mistakes when I was 20? Of course. And you're going to, you're going to be embarrassed as you get older for the way that you act. Trust me. You can laugh at it now, but just wait. Now, as you get up into more modern period, or, or the, the postmodern period, I'm speaking of modern here, like after Descartes, right? When we get to the Enlightenment, we get to Descartes, we get the idea of doubting everything. We get the, the, the rise of skepticism. Now, I'm not pro-skepticism. It's stupid. But what I'm saying is that the skeptics begin to ask questions at a meta level that you can't answer just by restating ancient and medieval philosophy. And if you study philosophy and epistemology at a graduate or undergraduate level, you will be forced to learn this and you will ask these questions, right? You can't just rehash and restate Thomism because you're not answering the objections that are at a more fundamental level about epistemology itself, about logic itself. Meta level questions, paradigmatic level questions. This is where philosophy goes. Some of the most important books in the history of philosophy uh, in epistemology in the last 10, 20 years are about this topic. Are our beliefs theory laden? Allow me to show you a typical textbook. If you go and take a class on epistemology, and I want to thank uh, Father Deacon for this recommendation. It's a good book. 
Bonjour on epistemology, typical kind of textbook you would have in an undergraduate or graduate class. What do you see here? What are the debates about foundationalism and coherentism? I've talked about this and worked in this field for 20 years. It's standard. You guys that haven't studied philosophy or epistemology, you don't even know what the topics of debate are. You're rehashing medieval stuff that doesn't even answer the questions because they're at a paradigmatic level. Grow up. <laughs> You're buffoons. This is standard debate and discourse on epistemology, metaphysics. You're almost literally at the level of the Dillahunty crowd in the comments under the Dillahunty debate. Like I noticed the similarity between the way the Thomists approach the questions. There's, there's like maybe a few IQ points difference between the Thomists and their actions and the way they act about this stuff and the atheists, because half of these guys were atheists two years ago. They've never even read Maximus, <laughs> but they're ready to debate it. Just foolish arrogance. Foundationalism, coherentism. This is a standard topic of debate. So we want to make that point, though. So Because one of the things that they're going to say is that I can't find a church father who makes a transcendental argument, even though I just showed you Don Damascus does. Yeah, dummy, because they weren't asking paradigmatic level questions. That's like saying the church fathers didn't talk about computers, so computers must be an invention of the devil. The trueness of the things behind these ideas, these concepts, these movements, right? Linguistic philosophy, the ancient medieval world didn't do linguistic philosophy. Does that mean we can't do linguistic philosophy because Aristotle and Aquinas didn't do it after, until Jean-Baptiste Vico did it? That's dumb, dude. That's dumb. So in the same way, the fact that the ancient and medieval philosophers did not ask meta-level, paradigmatic-level questions doesn't mean that we don't reply and do philosophy on the meta-paradigmatic level. Does the fact that Gerdell's incompleteness theorems, which are transcendental arguments in their form, does the fact that they weren't, they weren't done in the ancient medieval world make them invalid? That's so dumb. That is so dumb. Now, the first point I want to make about the bad arguments is that the, the, the five ways is that what good is an argument for Christianity when you join together and can and often do join together with a Muslim, a Scientologist, a Jehovah, Jehovah's Witness, and any other dumb cult out there? You're making the same argument that those people can make? The first cause God is not the same God they have, dummies. Is that not apparent? And if you were a thinking atheist, a thinking consistent unbeliever, and many of them are, they would call you out on that. They would say, "How are you're arguing for the same first cause as a Scientologist, a Muslim, a Jehovah's Witness. This doesn't make any sense. This is a terrible argument. It doesn't prove you're God. And they're right. It's a bad argument. Let's get into the specifics of the logical flaws in the five ways. We begin with the first cause. So I did sketch out some notes on this, but the first cause, the cosmological argument is an argument from created secondary causes, right? So we observe all of these different causes in creation. And it's a kind of chain that we lead back to a first cause within the natural order. I see a bunch of causes within the natural order. And then what the cosmological argument does is that it makes the leap Two, that there must have been a, quote, single supernatural cause. If I'm beginning my reasoning point from the causal order, the causal chain, and I believe that I can start from an empirical causal relation, it's a non sequitur to jump to a supernatural cause. A smart unbeliever can just simply say, why does there have to be a first cause? By the way, dummy, did you know that Aristotle con contradicts himself and says that there's a bunch of first causes and a first cause? He says two different things that contradict. So even Aristotle, the father of this dumb argument, isn't sure and isn't clear if the first cause is a bunch of gods and lesser gods or one single unmoved mover or maybe both. 
And yes, he says both things. This is a dumb argument. Next, we can look at the fact that the progress of philosophy in the Middle Ages begins to doubt that you perceive causality. I can make this very easy for you. Let's take David Hume. David Hume gives the example of the two billiard balls, right? Causality is billiard ball A bumps into billiard ball B. Right? Well, this is we all know that's what causality is, right? Now, as a Christian, I agree that that's what causality is. Totally. But now, remember, we're arguing with non-Christians. We're arguing with unbelievers, right? And some of them are skeptics. Many of them, since the Enlightenment, are skeptics. So if we're arguing with David Hume here, this argument isn't going to work because David Hume's just going to say, if you're an empiricist, and the Thomistic scheme does begin with empirical theology, let's be clear about that. Thomas says we're a tabula rasa. When you, if, if you want to start your system with empirical observation, you are not observing causality. You're observing event A, event B, and you're calling that causality. Now, I believe there is causality. You are, in a Christian sense, in the Christian paradigm, observing causality. However, remember, erase the Christian paradigm. We're not on the Christian paradigm. We're on the skeptic atheist paradigm for this, for this example. We're talking to David Hume here, right? Can, have, can Thomas not read David Hume? Did they have, have they not read this? This is common. Hume has a point. If I start with empiricism, I'm not observing causality. I'm observing an event and I'm calling that causality. This itself, where is that in that equation? This is a word that stands for a phenomena that I'm interpreting here. Do you actually empirically observe causality? No, you don't. Nowhere in this event, billiard ball A hitting billiard ball B, do you see causality, right? Is it like beaming into your head? Does this flash in neon in your mind when you see two billiard balls hitting? Causality, 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 causality. No, you intuit that that is the case. But if you began with empiricism, dum dum, you're not observing causality. You're just observing events that you're causing that you're calling causality. But now you say, wait a minute. If we deny causality, we're led to a bunch of nonsense. Ah, yes, that's a transcendental argument. Thank you. Exactly, exactly. When we deny the concept of causality, we are led to absurdities. That is a form of a transcendental argument. And a transcendental argument does not work in a classical foundationalist paradigm and system because classical foundationalism denies that observations are theory-laden. It's not rocket science. This is pretty easy, pretty clear. But we want to start out by pointing out that this cosmological argument doesn't work. If I believe that every event has a cause, I can't interject a special case that God doesn't have a cause. I say every event has a cause, therefore there had to be a first cause that's uncaused. If I've started my system and my reasoning with every event in a causal chain, it's invalid to leap to a supernatural cause. And so an unbeliever could just simply say, then it's always been here. Why is it illogical to believe in an infinite regress? Now, I know that there are responses to this argument, but that's not the point. The point is not, are there a bunch of uh, attempts to have uh, proofs uh, that there had to be a first cause and that it's irrational to believe? That's not the point. The point is that you can't reason from principles and operations in the natural world to the supernatural world without prior assumptions. So what, what the Christian apologists, right, and many Christians are better than their theology and their philosophy, what they're doing is simply assuming the Christian conception of causality. And because they think that causality is something that's self-evident, a self-evident maxim or principle, because it is evident that there is causality, right? But they think that because it's self-evident, that's more certain or a thing that we can go to that we have common ground with the unbeliever on. 
But in fact, we actually don't have that common ground on the unbelievers paradigm. Um, let's take an example of this. Let's just take something like matter, matter objects in the world, right? Something that you would say, oh, we all believe in matter. It's all just right there in front of us, isn't it? It's all the same stuff, right? It's all a contingent being. Now, wait a minute. Already from the outset, right? The Thomas says all that exists is composed of essence and existence. Therefore, it's contingent and had to have some initial cause that isn't composed. That's a bunch of metaphysical assumptions that you've not demonstrated. And so if somebody questions paradigms, you can't answer it. All you can do is repeat foundationalism. Well, some things are properly basic. They're just properly basic. Well, what if I doubt things that are properly basic? As the whole modern world does for the last 500 years, dum-dums. You can't just restate Thomism as an answer. It's not an answer. I'm going to show you why it's not an answer. Matter? Do you think that the unbeliever, the atheist, and the Christian has the same conception of something simple and obvious like matter? They don't. What is matter for a, an unbeliever? Well, let's just take the example of somebody, in this case, who believes that it's, it's an eternally existent stuff, prima, prima materia, something like Aristotle thought. It's just kind of stuff that's always been there and it kind of moves into different forms and then it goes back into a different form and right things, uh, 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 it becomes the tree, the acorn becomes the tree, it serves its purpose, it's telos, and then it goes back into nature and it's recycled and it's just, a, nature's a, the universe is a big giant recycling machine and stuff's just always been here recycling and that's what matter is. But is that what matter is to a believer? No. Matter is created. For this guy, matter is uncreated. It just always is. It's always been there. For us, it's created. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. And so for us, it has an immediate relationship to the God that we assume created it. And that God is not an impersonal force. He's not an it. He's not an abstraction. He's a personal he. I am that I am. That's a he, that's a statement of personhood. And if you don't understand the nature of person distinction, you will always be a heretic. That's what John of Damascus says. Every heretic, Thomas included, error because they confuse nature and person. And as a result, they confuse action, will, property, attribute, name, and person. In essence, it's all confused. But again, do you see the point here, right? Between two different paradigms, we can't even agree or we don't even know what matter is. There's not a, there's not a commonality on, on any concept because everything that exists in our paradigm is created and given its meaning by God. Matter is and means what it is because of the Logi. This is why Maximus destroys all this nonsense. He refutes it all. Every created thing in Maximus's theology, even in terms of natural theology, has its essence, its pattern, its archetype, its principle, all the universals, all the qualities, all the modes of being, their placement within time and space, their providence, and their ultimate purpose. These are the logi. Where are they grounded? And where do they have their meaning? Is it in abstract Greek philosophical concepts? Is it in the abstract Logos idea of Marcus Aurelius? Is it in a giant computer simulation? No, 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 no. Is it an abstract E. Michael Jones conception of Logos as a principle permeating the, nature, uh, the whole of the universe? Nope. All of the Logi are one in the Logos, and they bear an immediate testimony to the living presence of Jesus, the Logos, everywhere in creation. By him, all things live, move, have their being, exist, and subsist, and have their purpose. Paul is very explicit when he teaches the Logoi, doc, the Logi doctrine. It's the personal Logos 
that is the meaning of all creation. He is the Alpha and the Omega and everything in between. That means natural theology is not true, dummies. And that's why none of you believe in the Logi Doctrine. <laughs> and Maximus doesn't teach Thomas's doctrine. What does Thomas say about the ideas? Where are the divine ideas, according to Aquinas? They're in the essence of God, which is undifferentiated. That is dumb. So what we see with the cosmological argument is that it fails on its own grounds as a non sequitur. Let's give an example. If everything has a cause, and I'm reasoning from every created event back to an uncreated cause, what is being proven here is ultimately that I need a first cause God, right? But do we even know from the created order that all events have a single cause? When you're observing events in the created order, there's nothing in that process that tells you that there must be a first single cause. There's nothing in that process that tells you that there must be a first single cause that's personal or supernatural. Maybe it's a purely natural cause. Take, for example, David Hume. When Hume encountered this argument, he says, well, I can look and I see causes, but in the, in the world of causes that I see, if I look at a vegetable, a vegetable has a previous vegetable cause. It doesn't have a super vegetable cause. And Hume says the same thing for the teleological argument. He says that, well, I mean, a vegetable kind of has a process, but maybe the universe is just a big giant vegetable that's growing and, and mutating, right? He's more consistent than Aristotle. Aristotle is kind of an in-between kind of view here, right? Because Aristotle thinks there is some kind of divine first cause. It's not directly related to the world because that cause is thought thinking itself. But there's some kind of thing that starts everything in motion and then things kind of just vegetate and morph and, and, and recycle on their own in Aristotle's view, roughly speaking. And by the way, he's also not consistent on there being a first cause because he also says there are multiple first causes, the gods. But there's nothing in the causal chain in the created order, in the natural order, that proves or necessitates or logically implies there's no entailment, no necessary entailment that moves me to a supernatural cause. And that's the flaw of this dumb argument. That's just on the logical plane. That's not even talking about whether this is what Paul's talking about in Romans 1. We already saw that. Paul's not arguing this in Romans 1. It's nothing to do with Aristotle in Romans 1. It's nonsense. If everything has a, a, a cause, I can't then in the next premise in the syllogism leap to saying that God is a special exception who doesn't have a cause. Because I just said everything has a cause. So in other words, this argument assumes from the outset the existence of God. That's dumb. That's circular. And that's because the Christians who are making this dumb argument are doing it from the paradigm of Christianity. And there is a first cause, and he is a personal God. But it's true because God is the precondition for causality. Causality is not a precondition for proving an abstract Hellenic force. God, the personal God, the orthodox conception of the Christian God is the precondition for causality or for teleology. If you do not have faith in that God, you cannot utilize or justify belief in causality and teleology. That's the right way to formulate the argument. That's how to make the argument sound and not fallacious, not circular. So again, every event, every created event having a cause leading back to a supernatural uncreated cause assumes the very thing that is needed, needed to be proved here. It is circular and thus it violates its own classical foundationalist paradigm. You can't do circular arguments in classical foundationalism, dum-dums. Do we even know from the created order that all events have a single cause? No. Maybe there's 17,000 different first causes. I mean, you're a, you can't just make those logical leaps just on a solid, just on the logical grounds. You can't. 
So in other words, when the cosmological proponents assume that there had to be a singular first, first cause, they're just assuming what re revelation in scripture says. Yeah, exactly. But you can't import revealed doctrines into natural theology. That's a different tier. That's why this doesn't work. And we're going to see that consistently throughout, that's what they do. And they do that because they're inconsistent. They have two different paradigms at work here. Let's talk about the infinite regress. Why must an infinite regress be ruled out if we're starting with the created order? There's nothing in, in reasoning about the created order that tells me that there's not a, an infinite regress. You say, but it's irrational. Why? Because there had to be a first cause. Yeah, well, thank you for spouting the Christian dogma, but that just assumes the very thing that you're trying to prove with this dumb argument. What if I'm talking to somebody who just simply believes that the universe has always been here? An atheist can simply say there doesn't have to be a first cause. The universe just is. It's just always been here. And then what happens is the cosmological argument proponent will say, but every event has a cause. Therefore, all events have a cause. Uh-oh. Guess what? That's an informal fallacy, dum-dums. That's the fallacy of composition. The fact that each individual cause has a cause does not lead you to all events having a cause. That's mistaking what's true of the part for the whole. That's the composition fallacy. That's a fallacy. On classical foundationalist grounds, which all the classical arguments are premised on classical foundationalist epistemology, you can't commit fallacies. This is an informal fallacy. It's the parts whole fallacy. The composition fallacy. An atheist who knows his fallacies will just simply point that out. And if you are honest, you'll say that he's right. Because what you need to say is that causality is a precondition for the intelligibility of experience. It's real. It exists. It's a metaphysical principle but it presupposes the God that we believe in to be sensible. And again, Aristotle himself didn't think that there was necessarily one cause. Aristotle says two dumb, contradictory things. There's a single unmoved mover, and there's also a bunch of gods who are unmoved movers. So it doesn't work. The, the teleological argument uh, suffers from the same issues. You don't observe and see design any more than you observe and see causality. Now, do I believe that you observe and see design? Yes, because God exists and because the world is what God says. All right. But if I'm swiping all that away and I'm starting from scratch and I'm going to assume, what, tabula rasa, brute facts? As if facts in the world don't come pre-interpreted? As if there's just, you don't, there's no brute facts, dum-dums. This has been abandoned. Philosophy doesn't believe this anymore. It's been abandoned because you can't demonstrate brute factuality. It's impossible. Everybody comes to their interpretive field or matrix with presuppositions. It's impossible to be completely factually, logically, epistemically, metaphysically neutral. It's just simply not possible. It's been demonstrated many times over. Read Action and Perception by Alvin Noe. Even scientifically and empirically, it's been demonstrated that we're not uh, 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 tabula rasa blank slate video recorders who just record the facts and interpret them neutrally. But Thomism and natural theology is premised on some degree, some level of neutrality. Does that mean we're, we're Calvinists? No, we're not Calvinists. Because St. Maximus, the Logi doctrine has nothing to do with Calvinism. Calvinists don't believe in the doctrine of the noose. Duh. Now, as we said, the same issue that is present with the teleological argument is the same as the problems in the cosmological argument. Why does a list of natural causes or design lead to a uh, logical leap of a supernatural origin? This leap is a false conclusion. It's a non sequitur. 
If design is seen in the natural world, it doesn't follow that there is therefore a supernatural designer. Maybe the design that exists is just a reproduction of what's already in the natural world. Again, Hume comes into play here because Hume says the universe is just a giant vegetable that just spits out new vegetables. He says, when I look at a carrot and a carrot produces another carrot, I don't assume the great carrot. I don't assume the great pumpkin. One pumpkin gives rise to another pumpkin. Where's the great pumpkin? It's the leap that's a non sequitur. That's why this is a dumb argument. Now, is there design in the world? Yes. But design is a transcendental precondition for the intelligibility of experience, and it presupposes the Christian God. That's the way that you reformulate it. Again, if you listen to the, the debate with Matt, that's what I consistently said throughout the debate. Yes, there is such a thing as design in, t in telos. Yes, there is such a thing as beginning, middle, and end, right? The threefold uh, structure of reality according to Maximus, according to Aristotle. But those are preconditions. They're not, you don't empirically, you don't find telos under a microscope. You see a bunch of phenomena and you interpret them as telos. But as Hume said, if you're going to start with empiricism, you're not, strictly speaking, empirically experiencing teleology or design. If you have a Christian presupposition and paradigm, then you believe you are and you are, right? Again, I'm not saying design isn't real. Listen, all you low IQ people, pay attention. Thomists, I'm being very sp specific here. I'm not saying that there's no design in the world. There is. It's everywhere. Every fact can, uh, uh, testifies to the existence of God. That's what Paul says in Romans 1, right? We ought to look at every single object in the world and see Jesus. We ought to see the logi in everything and how it testifies to the existence of Christ. That's what Paul says in Colossians, right? Everything that exists came to be through the Logos, subsists in the Logos, and has its purpose in the Logos. But why don't we do that? Is it because it's unclear? Nature is unclear? God hasn't provided enough evidences? We haven't philosophically speculated enough? No, that's not why. It's because we're fallen and our noose is darkened. Our heart noose is darkened. Romans 1. And that's why Maximus says, as Palamas says, as St. Justin Popovich says in his Doctrine of Knowledge, famous essay, when we do participate in theosis, when we become godlike, then we begin to see things in the Logos. It's not the essence of God that we see. We see all things in their uncreated Logi, he says. Not the essence of God. That's why it's two different doctrines. Now back to the teleological argument. Um, Design is something that we interpret of the world. Let's give another example that I've given many times that disproves this argument. If we just start with empirical observation of the natural world, uh, we see a predator-prey symbiotic death-life relationship, don't we? When a thing dies, living creatures come and feed on it. There's this symbiotic relationship. There's a predator-prey relationship all throughout the natural world. Is that natural? If I reason up from that to God, I'm presented with a Gnostic archon psychopath deity. This is another point that the atheist contingent are correct about because they're correct in that they're responding to the dumb arguments of the Thomists. The natural world shows you predator-prey relationships. It shows you death as a natural principle. And that's why many of the dumb Thomists think death is natural. That's a heresy condemned at the Troll Synod, reaffirmed, at the Seventh Council. The Seventh Synod affirms the Trollo ratification of two propositions, two, two statements. Well, it's one canon, but it has two statements in the canon. That if you believe that death is a natural product prior to Adam and Eve, if you believe that, that death in the natural world happened prior to Adam and Eve's fall, you're condemned, you're anathematized. And that, that applies to the theistic evolutionists across the board, whether they're in orthodoxy or wherever they're at. And most of the Thomists are theistic evolutionists. You're condemned by that proposition. And yes, I'm right about that. It, it, it's there and it's ratified by the Seventh Council. You can't believe in theistic evolution and believe in the fall in Genesis. You're condemned. Most of these Thomists believe that, but they're just being consistent with natural theology. But I can disprove natural theology right there. Because you don't believe, Thomas, do you, that the world that exists as it is now is the natural state of things, is it? No, it's fallen. 
But guess what? The doctrine of the fall. That's a that's a doctrine of revelation, isn't it? So you need a doctrine of revelation to properly interpret the natural world. Paul says in Romans 8 that the whole created order is subject to death, decay, and bondage because of Adam's fall. That means you can't interpret the natural world correctly without revelation. Can you get parts of it right? Yeah. Philosophers can speculate and get parts of it right. Aristotle did. Plato did. Sure. But what happens when I ask about predator-prey relationships. Is that natural? And then the, the tone is, oh, no, 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 this is a, an aberration uh, because of defects that have occurred because of all, the fall, exactly. But the fall is a doctrine of revealed theology. But as a Thomist, you can't bring revealed theology into your natural theology. It doesn't work. So we see then that the design argument, the teleological argument, if we begin with the created order as it exists now leads to a psychopathic God who creates death and life to exist at the same time. And we have to fall back on revelation to explain the fact that death and the predator prey relationship have entered the, the natural world as a defiance of the original plan of God. And I would just simply say that all you dumb theistic evolutionists, all you need to do is read Cornelius Hunter's great book, Darwin's God, because he shows the trek of this stupid argument in the history of the West, where the design argument proponents literally said all this stuff, and the atheists all just said, the design of this world shows you a psychopath God, if that's true. But then the stupid classical the theistic arguments can't appeal to revealed theology because then that... that removes the classical foundationalist classical theistic arguments but you can't interpret the natural world without the fall dummies and that's why he shows that it leads directly to gnosticism and deism exactly it's not accidental that all these thomas for the most part not every one of them, you can find some random creationist thomas out there somewhere that they exist hidden but almost all these clowns don't even believe in Genesis in the historic sense. Even though the Confession of St. Sophronius explicitly says you have to believe Eden, Adam, and Eve, and all that was historical, and it condemns Origen's allegorization of Genesis explicitly. Now, what about the ontological argument, this kind of outlier type thing? Uh, and, of course, Aquinas explicitly rejects the ontological argument, right? And what about the Tome, or the, the Roman Catholic would say, yeah, but Jay, these are just uh, uh, competing schools within Catholicism, competing schools. They don't really necessarily mean you can't. Uh, maybe there's proponents of Catholic theology who, who, who could utilize a, a transcendental argument. Uh, what about the SCOTUS? The SCOTUS, uh, they don't believe... Uh, 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 and all this stuff that, 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 that the Thomists believe. And that's a valid school with it within the... <laughs> well, let's look. What did the famed Thomist Fesser this week, what did he talk about? Remember how uh, when all the lunatics were debating me about Scotism as if this was some legitimate response? What did I say? I said Scotism is irrelevant because Scotism doesn't teach a real distinction. It says the formal distinction, which is a, an attempt to have a midway between Thomism and the orthodox doctrine of a real distinction. I'm going to put it in the chat. This week, thank you, Dr. Fesser, the great Thomist philosopher, Dr. Fesser, says what I've been saying. Once again, Fesser proves me right. When Fesser wrote about what the simplicity of God was, what did he say? He said everything I said. All the predicates are identical to the divine essence. Thank you. When he talks about SCOTUS, what does he say? The formal distinction is not a real distinction. Thank you. That's what I've been saying all along. And it doesn't matter what you believe as a uniate, because uniatism is self-refuting. Uniatism says that you can hold multiple different competing theologies. Gregory Palamas can be a heretic for hundreds of years. Oh, but now uh, uh, around the time of Vatican II and John Paul, uh, we can now say uh, Palamas is a saint. The Melkite website can say that there's only seven ecumenical councils, even though the Roman Catholic Church says you have to hold to all ecumenical councils all the way up to Vatican II, right? I mean, it's nonsense position. You can literally not believe in ecumenical councils as a Melkite. 
It's total contradiction. And what that proves is that the UNIA position is nothing more than an attempt to lure Orthodox people under the sway of Rome. The only thing they care about is do you accept the Pope? They don't care about the theology. When Mauritian struggles with concepts was arguing with me the other day, what did he say? Bro, I don't care about the theology. I don't care about the theology, mate. I just have to read history and I become, I become a papal apologist, mate. Uh, I'm a papal apologist and a papal lawyer, mate. Uh, listen to how condescending I am. Uh. Yeah, exactly. You don't care about the theology because the theology is not what matters in Roman Catholicism. All that matters is are you a papal apologist? And what does Fezzer say? Scotism is an attempt to have a midway, and it doesn't teach a real distinction. And all the lunatics, Luke, lunatic Luke, going crazy, that's what I said to him the whole time. Dr. Jared Goff, that's what I said to him the whole time. And that's why these people are getting so nasty, is because they're insane. They can't reason properly. They're loons. They're getting destroyed. And so they're losing their mind. So what about the ontological argument? Well, I wrote a paper uh, because we actually had um, one of the guys in the Bradshaw circles, not Brad, Dr. Bradshaw, a different dude back when I was an undergrad. Get this. This is pretty cool, actually. He came and gave a talk uh, from University of Kentucky. And I, at the time, I didn't get it because I was still a Thomist. I was very interested in his lecture, but he gave a critique of the ontological argument and about, about how it relied on certain notions of being and that Malebranche and later theologians actually disprove the ontological argument on the basis of absolute divine simplicity. I'm not joking about that. Uh, uh, I wish I could remember this guy's name because this is like, 2005 or six, but I'm going to, I'm going to put in the, in the chat here for you, my paper that I wrote, this is years after his lecture. Once I actually understood his argument and what, what Malbranch was saying and why the ontologists were condemned in the Orthodox or in the Roman Catholic church. So Malbranch and the, the ontologists, as they were called, eventually got condemned because their view uh, either tended towards deism or pantheism. Um, so I talk about that in that essay. So you can read that whole essay up for a fuller critique of the ontological argument, and it falls prey to the same mistakes that we've already seen. All right. So for one, uh, if we think back to the ontological argument, God as a necessary concept, uh, and to be, uh, if, if, you're the, if God is the highest good, the most perfect being, then he must exist. Well, the first problem with this is that it assumes that existence is a predicate, right? It assumes, it assumes existence and qualitative judgments about perfection. But that's not immediately present in the argument itself. You have to have these other qualifying uh, uh, notions and category judgments about lesser beings, lesser existence, perfect existence, gradations of being, right? That it's better to exist than to not exist. That's an assumption, a presupposition about value judgments, right? Is it better? to exist and to not exist? What if you're a Buddhist? A Buddhist doesn't believe that it's better to exist and not exist. So the ontological argument is dumb to a Buddhist. He's going to be like, I don't believe that it's there's some perfection to existing. Now, if you're a Christian and you have a Christian paradigm, then the ontological argument will be convincing because you'll believe that existing is better than non-existing. But to many world religions and many philosophies out there, there's, that's a presupposition that you've not yet demonstrated, but it's presupposed in your argument, as are a bunch of other metaphysical, metaphysical concepts that you've not yet demonstrated. So the teleological argument suffers from similar issues, even though it's a different approach. And it's an attempt to have an a priori approach and not an a posteriori empirical approach to your argumentation. Why are human reasoning and intelligibility intelligible without a God? That's the first thing that we should ask. And it assumes, the ontological ar argument assumes that the unbeliever can reason appropriately and correctly, even about the predicates of God without believing in God. 
Can an unbeliever reason cogently and correctly? Is his conception of being the same as the unbeliever? Now, again, keep in mind that this ontological argument, as it's formulated, is just making statements about existence and being, as if these are univocal, terminological, across all paradigms the same. I don't know what being is outside of the whole Christian paradigm and context. That's what informs my notion of being. Being is not some generic concept that everybody has the same notion of. It's, all, it's always the same. It's not a, a theory-neutral idea or concept. Being is not something that simply bees. I remember having a, con, a conversation with when I first converted to Roman Catholicism, and I was talking to a priest who had written his thesis, PhD thesis, on the ontological argument, and he was trying to defend it, and he said that the most ultimate foundation for philosophy for proving god's existence is the concept of generic being and he said that we know this because being bees being bees i'm not joking that's what he said that's how dumb this was right being simply bees oh wow being is more certain than god exactly right this is pagan nonsense there's no theory neutral concept or notion of being that everybody shares. In fact, the apophatic doctrine of who God is says that God's being and God is radically different from created being. God's being is uncreated. And as St. Gregory Nazianzus says in the theological oration where he talks about God's being and seeing God as he is, he says that we will see God in his very being, but not his essence. Because being, God's existence, itself is an uncreated energy. Even God's being, even God's existence is an energy. And the Eastern Fathers are unified on that doctrine. That's why they don't say, even when they say we see all things in God, as Maximus says, they say that we will see uncreated energies, not the essence of God. I have an essay on that, proving that, by the way, because as I did, by the way, Thomas, I did the same thing you all do. I went to Gregory Nazianzus and I said, where, where he's he says we see God. Maximus says we see God. Therefore, beatific vision. It's not beatific vision because if you read them further, they go on to explicate very clearly that we will not see the essence of God. Maximus is explicitly clear that we see the uncreated logi, and they're not the they're energies. I showed you in my paper. I just wrote, is grace created or uncreated? I show you from Maximus explicitly that he teaches uncreated energies, uncreated grace, and that the Logi are not the essence of God. Thomas says they are. And being bees is dumb. There's no such thing as being bees, as if that was some theory-neutral, obvious idea that, oh, uh, uh, Matt Dillahunty and I have the same notion of what being is. Even Matt Dillahunty could recognize that we don't mean the same things by the terms we use. When I look out at the world, I see created being, right? Created by God. That's what I start with. That's my, pre my foundational presupposition about the created world. And that's what scripture says. That's what's true, right? We believe that. Does the atheist see that? In a sense, he does, because deep down in his heart, he, know God's, he knows God, God is uh, his God, his creator, and that he's a rebel. That's what Romans 1 says. But when he sees the, the natural world, he tells himself that it's just there. It just is. That was Matt's whole argument, remember? Well, the world just is. It just is. There's no first cause. It's just it's always been here. It just is. Brute facts. You can't join with an unbeliever in arguing for brute facts because you're stepping onto his paradigm. And if you step onto his paradigm, he will make a fool of you if he's a smart unbeliever. Because he will prove to you that you don't see causality. You don't see teleology. You don't see and have a conception of necessary perfect beings. That's a philosophic metaphysical assumption that you've not demonstrated yet. Remember, this is your starting point. You're trying to start with natural theology and reasoning from the created order. But you can't interpret the created order correctly without revelation. That's why Father Stan Eloy, in his first book of dogmatics, goes directly to Maximus and says that we don't believe in natural theology because we follow Saint Maximus.
it would be a good point to move to that. Now, when we get to Actus Purus, by the way, it's the same stuff. Uh, a couple more points on, on uh, the ontological argument failing. That being, uh, other than which nothing greater can be conceived, assumes that existence is a predicate. Existence is a perfection, therefore, but this has not been demonstrated, right? Is, ex ex is existence a perfection or a predicate? If God is perfect, you're assuming a scale of judgment of good and evil, and this metaphysical scale has not yet been demonstrated in this proposition. Therefore, the ontological argument makes assumptions that can, have not yet been proven, and therefore it is not a good starting point. And an atheist will simply call this out. God as a highest perfection presupposes the Christian value system by which you presuppose that God's existence is the highest level of perfection. Right. But that's not a pre but we want a presuppositional argument, right? <laughs> Ultimately, yes. So in a way you could say the ontological argument is a step in the right direction, but it still tries to utilize common conceptions that don't exist. Um A Buddhist can reply that existence is not a good, and the ontological argument fails to confront the Buddhist paradigm. The Logos Logi doctrine uh, in the Eastern Fathers and in Maximus teaches us Jesus. The Logos is not an abstract formulation. He's not an abstract principle. He's what the pagans were seeking after, but as Paul says in Acts 17, they, uh, they did not know. They failed to know. Now, I'm, it sounds like I'm saying two contradictory things, but you said that they do know God. They do, because, as Paul says in Romans 1, deep down in our noose, we all know God. Our heart of hearts, we all know God, and we suppress that knowledge because of the fall, and we don't reason properly when it comes to the natural world. When I look out at nature and I try to interpret nature, it doesn't give me the existence of a generic theism, of a generic little G God, of a God that I can share with the Scientologist, the Jehovah's Witness, and the Mormon, uh, and the Muslim, as Thomism does argue for, which is completely retarded. Creation displays a predator-prey relationship, and it teaches, therefore, it should show that death is natural. And so all of the post-Enlightenment philosophers and philosophes who followed through with natural theology ended up as deists and atheists precisely because of this point. Cornelius Hunter shows that in his book. Theology must match up to our apologetic. That's the point here. We can't have an apologetic that's out of accord with our theology. Now, does that mean I'm teaching Calvinism? No. St. Maximus's theology is not Calvinism. Do you think Stein Eloy is a Calvinist when he writes a whole book saying, at the beginning, the Orthodox Church makes no separation between natural and supernatural revelation standard orthodox dogmatics that i tell you and these dumb thomists act like i'm not even a representative of what orthodox theology says just read chapter one of this book it says everything i've been saying for months and years empiricism assumes induction this is another point this is the point i kept hammering to matt right but the Thomas has not yet asserted or proven induction. He simply assumes it in his empirical process. But if we're going to be classical foundationalists, how do we respond to the person who doubts induction? You can't just reaffirm that beliefs are properly basic to people who are doubting properly basic beliefs. They're going to say you're being circular. And if you say that they're being philosophically foolish and committing a reductio, then you're starting to make a transcendental argument. <laughs> exactly. So the Thomists, the classical foundationalists, are not prepared when people question and doubt classical foundationalist epistemology. That's what I've been here telling you. The ancient and medieval world didn't doubt it. The modern world does. That's why we need to respond to the modern world with a transcendental argument. Apophatic theology harmonizes perfectly with orthodox theology because the transcendental argument for God, in many formulations, is an indirect argument. Hence, more compatible with apophatic theology. Apophatic theology necessitates the essence-energy distinction, as all of our theologians show and teach. God is not like anything in the created order. Paul says this in Acts 17. Hence, we are led to a coherentist view of truth. And even in coherentism, we have to admit 
that the relations between truths and propositions and beliefs, when we talk about them being coherent, how do we demonstrate that they're coherent? How do we demonstrate that that's true? It's an intuitive assumption, isn't it? Of course it is. Yes. That propositions and beliefs are coherent or make sense is circular. It's assumed in the process, but that's okay on a coherent system because it allows for at the paradigmatic level, circular presuppositions and paradigms at the paradigmatic level. It argues for and believes in circular beliefs. So if we, again, consider Romans 118, that truth isn't philosophical speculation, but is an innate revelation to the noose, to the darkened heart, right? The heart of hearts. That's why man has no excuse. And that's why Romans 1 is not Aristotle's causal chain and metaphysics. It's a statement about the direct presence. The word is near you, even in your heart. Paul says this to the dumb pagans. The wisdom of this world is foolishness, and yet the word is near you, even in your heart. Christ is not far from every man, because the logi of all creation are one in the logos. And thus he is imminently and immediately present to all creation. Why does God's revelation not contain a bunch of abstract argumentation of the five proofs? If the five proofs are perfectly in harmony with what Romans 1 says. Romans 1 is not Aristotle's five proofs. It's a refutation of Aristotle's five proofs. It is not natural theology. It is natural revelation. What is the beginning of this freaking chapter? And again, I'm just showing you that what I'm saying, I know you don't accept it, but it's orthodox theology. Natural revelation, not natural theology. So what we want to do first here is read a few pages of Father Stein Eloy demonstrating that what I'm saying is orthodox. I know that you goofuses don't believe it, but it is orthodox theology. The orthodox church does not make a separation between natural and supernatural revelation. Natural revelation is known and understood fully in the light of supernatural revelation. Or we might say that natural revelation is given and maintained by God continuously through his own divine act, which is above nature. This is why St. Maximus the Confessor does not posit an essential distinction between natural revelation and the supernatural or biblical one. According to him, the latter, biblical, is only the embodying of the former in the historical process of persons and actions, the logi. The affirmation Saint Maximus must pro of, of, of Maximus must probably be taken more in the sense that these are two revelations not divorced from one another. Supernatural revelation unfolds and brings forth its fruit within the framework of natural revelation, like a kind of casting of the work of God into bolder relief. In guiding the physical and historical world towards the goal of which it was created in accordance with a plan laid down from all the ages. Supernatural revelation merely restores direction to and provides a more determined support for that inner movement maintained within the world by God through natural revelation. At the beginning, moreover, in that state of the world, which was fully normal, that is in Eden, natural revelation was not separated from revelation that was supernatural. Consequently, supernatural revelation places natural revelation itself within a clearer light. It is possible, however, to speak both of natural revelation and supernatural, since within the framework of natural revelation, the work of God is not emphasized in the same way, nor is it evident as it is in supernatural revelation. So it's the same content, God himself, Christ, the Logos, but looked at from different modes or from different angles. Speaking more con concretely and in accordance with our faith, the content of natural revelation is the cosmos and man who is endowed with reason, conscience, and freedom. But man is not only an object that can be known within this revelation. He is also subject to the knowledge of revealed theology. Both man and the cosmos are equally the product of a creative action of God, which is above nature. And both are maintained in existence by God through an act of conservation, which has likewise a supernatural character. So then he goes on to talk about natural revelation, and he says that, but man come... Man and the cosmos constitute a natural revelation also from the point of view of knowledge. The cosmos is organized in a way that corresponds to our capacity for knowing, the anthropic principle, right? The cosmos and, the, and human nature, as intimately connected with the cosmos, are stamped with rationality. 
while man, God's creation, is further endowed with reason and makes him capable of consciously knowing the rationality of the cosmos and of his own nature. Nevertheless, according to Christian theology, this rationality of the cosmos and of human reason, which enables us to know, are, on the other hand, the product of the creative act of God. So natural revelation itself comes from God. The natural revelation is not something purely natural from this point of view. Let's talk about the Logi. Christian supernatural revelation asserts that the same asserts the same thing when it teaches that to God's original creative and conserving position vis-a-vis -vis the world, there corresponds on a lower plane what is by nature dependent, our own position as being made in the image of God and able to know and transform nature. In this position of man, it can be seen that the world must have its origin in a being which is intended through the creation of the world and through its preservation comes to intend so that man should come to a knowledge of the world through itself and a knowledge of this being. This means that we are not for the sake of the world, but the world is for the sake of us, although man does, not, does also need the world. The point is that the world is to be found in man and not vice versa. Right? So the, this is the macrocosm, microcosm principle of St. Maximus. The reasons or the logi of the, or the inner principles of the world, the created order, these things reveal their light to human reason through the conscious, rational action of man. Likewise, our reason reveals its own proper depth even more richly by uncovering the logi within created things. Yet, in this reciprocal influence, it is human reason and not the logi within created things that has the role of a, of a subject working consciously. The reasons within created things disclose themselves to human consciousness and must therefore be sublimated, to, assimilated to and concentrated within human reasoning. They disclose themselves insofar as they have human reason as their virtual conscious center and by helping reason to become their own actual center. They are the potential rays of human reason on their way towards being revealed as the actual rays, the uncreated rays. And it is through these that human reason extends its vision further and further. All right. So then man is a good creation of God, and this is true because he is the microcosm of the macrocosm. This is right, so he goes to Maximus. Now, if you have this book, then you will know that the next argument that he makes on page six is about how we begin with God as personal and not as abstract essence, not as abstract reason. The idea of uh, the repetition of nature does not allow us to have natural theology. We need revealed theology to interpret the natural world, he goes on to say. The logi within creation shows us, as St. Maximus says, page 8, a personal God, immediately and directly. And thus there is no personal absolute, page 9. Page 10, we know that then at the, at the ground of the whole uh, created world, there is a eternal, personal, loving God. And then page 11, this is our presupposition, and it's the only explanation of the created world. The absolute being impersonal or reasoning to the absolute being impersonal leads us to nihilism and to a denial of the anthropic principle. And that's why natural theology doesn't work. There is, in a sense, a difference between natural and supernatural revelation. The difference is not the content, but the mode and the means by which it comes to us. The content of both natural and supernatural revelation is the person of the Logos. Yes, Goofus, is, it's that easy. Now he goes on in the second chapter to supernatural revelation. This is the most important. I, don't, I know you don't care and you don't believe it, but he's the most important Orthodox theologian of the 20th century. He's the best one. He's the deepest one. He then goes to refuting pantheism, nihilism, atheism, paganism on the basis of all of those systems leading to an impersonal Hellenistic abstract principle. All the arguments you hear me make constantly. And on and on and on. Telos and natural revelation show us the logos. They don't show us a generic first cause. All of these things immediately testify to the Logos, not generic theism. 
Anybody who reads that book will see that everything that I've been telling you for the last several years is true. Now, if you listen to last week's show, you know that we covered 200 chapters of Maximus in the second hour for subscribers. And we showed how in the first section, he says that God is simple, but reflection on nature does not lead us to a correct conception of God because God is not a first principle. And then he goes on to say, but God is the first principle. Uh Uh-oh, is Maximus contradicting himself within two pages? No, he's saying the same thing that I've been saying. In one sense, God is first cause, first principle. In another sense, God is not first cause and not first principle. That's the first five pages of 200 chapters on theology. Now, in the next section, I'm going to take you through Aquinas, and we're going to talk about being and existence, essence and existence. We're going to show from Aquinas himself in the work on being and essence that actus purus is all predicated on his doctrine of absolute divine simplicity. I'm going to demonstrate that to you directly from Aquinas. I'm going to take you point by point through the five ways. I'm going to take you point by point through the ambiguum seven Ambiguum 7, and then I'm going to take you over to Ambiguum 15, and we're going to read page by page, not every page, because it's long, but the important pages, and I'm going to show you how the Logi Doctrine is not this doctrine. Make sure I got to the main points for part one in my notes. Uh, so in regard to the, oh yeah, the, uh, in regard to the objections, um, John of Damascus, uh, no, we've seen that he teaches a transcendental argument in found of knowledge. Uh, Orthodox people don't do transcendental arguments. Oh yeah, the whole first two chapters of this book are a presuppositional critique of atheism, nihilism, and Darwinism. You're wrong. If you read Genesis Creation Early Man, a book that we promote very strongly at Jay's analysis. You'll see multiple, within the first 300 pages, you'll notice multiple presuppositional critiques of atheism. Father Rose does transcendental presuppositional critiques consistently. This book has multiple presuppositional critiques of other worldviews, pagan worldviews. If you read Dr. Philip Sherrard's essay, Tradition and the Traditions, he does a presuppositional critique of Shuan's perennial argument. So all of these dum-dums that say that there's no transcendental argumentation in orthodoxy are just simply wrong. The Logos Logi doctrine is not absolute divine simplicity and it's not natural theology. Uh, Let's see. Okay. So I think I've hit most of the points in my note. This is the talk that's free for the first half for you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, we went through the, by the way, the five ways are summed up in, in, in that section of the Summa. Thomas says there's five ways. Then he says there's three ways. And he also says there's two ways because they're all kind of versions of the same argumentation. So the argument from motion, uh, the argument from efficient causes, the argument from, uh, re- the next one's a reductio about contingent beings, um, the argument from the gradation of being, and there's an argument from telos or design, right? They're, the two or three of those are actually just variations on the same one. And then when we get to uh, on being in essence, we'll see that they're all really just saying one thing about why God has, why God's essence has to be his existence. So we'll look at uh, uh, section 181 of the Summa. We'll look at section uh, 1A3 and 4, 1A22, and 1A1212. So these are the sections in the Summa where Thomas is going to... uh, And then, of course, obviously at the very beginning where he talks about the five ways. Um, And ultimately what we're going to see is that this is just about saying that Everything that exists in the created world is composed of essence and existence, right? These things are, because we can predicate and understand and know these things without knowing their essences per se, then that shows that there's a composition to created things, the things in this world. 
So there has to be some being that's the first cause, that's the origin, that's the non-contingent uh, uh, beginning of all of these contingent things. And he can't be composed in any sense. And so therefore, God is absolutely simple. All the stuff that I've been saying the whole damn time and Prince Nigerian email scam who was arguing with me on Mauritian's struggles, he couldn't even grasp this, right? Basic Thomism. I know what the five ways are. I listed the five ways in the argument. And when I started going through him, he screamed so much that I couldn't even finish what I was saying. But all, all it, it's all the same argument for pure act. God is pure act because everything in the created order is composed. It's that simple. So there has to be a, a being that's the first being who is a self-subsistent being that's not a combination or a composition of essence and existence, right? His essence must be his existence, therefore. And that's in this book at the beginning. Basic Thomism. Stuff we talked about, I've got essays on that I've talked about for, for ages. Uh, also, in part two, we will go through the specific sections of the Summa that deal with God's simplicity. Those are different. They are, I have an essay that I wrote a long time on this. We will be looking at uh, question three, section seven. These are all part one. Question 13, one. Question three, three. Question eight, one and four, one through four. 12, 12, question two, those are short, one, two, three. Those are all relevant to absolute divine simplicity. So even though we've already done this, we'll do it again. We're going to go through point by point each section of the Summa and the Ambigua to show the difference. That will be in part two for the subscribers. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to cover tonight. But that's why the... Uh, Arguments don't work. The classical arguments do not work because they're fallacious and they're dealing with a world that had not yet questioned foundations. But the modern world has questioned foundations. Let's get to the super chats. Thank you guys for, for tonight. Uh, Wu Lad, two pounds. Thank you. Appreciate that. Joseph Kerr, 20 bucks. All Thomas do is slander orthodoxy, yep, and restate their position over and over. Yeah, they think that that constitutes an argument. And what's actually happening is they're actually just working out and figuring out Thomism as they uh, get these challenges, right? Because let's be honest, they're not sitting there reading through the, the Summa. I have read through the Summa. I haven't read the entire Summa. I've read the full, the first full volume of both Summa Contra Gentiles and Summa Theologica. And I've read a lot of the other volumes of the Summa Theologica. But those are the two most important ones because Summa Contra Gentiles Volume 1 is strictly natural theology and trying to argue and prove the existence of the first cause. And then Volume 1 of the Summa Contra Gent, uh, uh, Theologica, Summa, <laughs> Volume 1 of the Summa Theologica, uh, is about the starting point for the Thomistic Order of Theologia, right? Um, so, yes, that's what they do. Um, and they assume that they are, it's an arrogance. It's a pride. Uh, I was the same way as a Thomist. I was very arrogant, very prideful because you think that you found the system that, that basically answers everything. And Thomas is just an idol. And then when you're presented with very, uh, uh, basic argumentation against it, what you do is you run to the other sections in the Summa where you think that that proves your case when you're, you're not answering the argument because the argument is that Thomas has two conflicting things. Right. So then they run to an area where he says something that's true or sounds like what we're saying. And they say, see, it's the same. It's the same. Look, Thomas doesn't say that. He says this. I'm saying he says two different things, dummy. Yeah, that's why it's very hard. It's a box and uh, they have to really exercise repentance before they can come out of that box. Um, but as Paul says, uh, beware of a new convert because they're puffed up and we're talking about people who were two years ago, they were an atheist. Uh, two years later, they're, they're masters of Thomism, and they're arguing with people who've done this for 20 years. It's just super, super pre-list. Justin Stam, 20 bucks. Got to go listen later. I uh, just wanted to send support. Thank you, Justin. Much appreciated. Jay and gang, thank you very much. Do I chew tobacco? I do not. I have not. I chewed tobacco when I was like in eighth, eighth grade. Yeah. 
I tried it in sixth and eighth grade, and both times dip made me puke, and I've never chewed tobacco. Hans Lager too. Uh, I love your dumb and pay for your smarts. You get both here, in a perfect, harmonious symphonia of dumb and smart. Thank you, Hans Lager. Much appreciated. JMD Apologetics 199. What do you think of Molinism? Yeah, I mean, these kinds of uh, sort of Jesuistic, J Jesuit uh, uh, debates and Bellarmine debates of Suarez and Molinism and all that, we, we don't have that. We don't have Lagrange's predestination. Orthodox theology believes in compatibilism, obviously. And we simply say that none of these sort of dialectical things that are set up within Thomism, Thomism is really bad about dialectics. For example, the idea that that God uh, is either composed or absolutely simple is a dialectic, and that's why they can't understand that when St. John Damascus talks about uncreated energies and them being really distinct, that he's not saying that they're accidents, because he doesn't believe that, that that's a violation of God's simplicity, because we believe that God can be simple, and that there can be real distinctions in God without violating his simplicity, because we believe it on the basis of revealed theology, and that's what's in the Fathers and the Councils. And you can't have correct Christology unless you accept that. That's why it's the Christological arguments that really show the essence energy distinction fully. Evan Schultz, 20 bucks. Can't watch most of this live. Just wanted to send some super berries. Thanks, Jay. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, this is the free half. In the second half, we will go more specifically into point by point the arguments in Aquinas himself, each page, page by page. I know it's, I know this is rough, but trust me, it's going to be worth it because if you really want to reply to these guys adequately, um, you'll, you'll want to go page by page, citation by cita citation in the Summa, and actually volume one of the Summa, or you could just read volume one of the Summa of Contras in Chiles. It's not that much. I mean, it could take you a while. But, I mean, the main issues are the first, you know, several questions, right? First 13 and then up into, I think, 39, uh, like 1 through 39, maybe. Yeah, um, I'll give you, this is what we're going to be talking about, this old essay I wrote. Here's the specific citations in the Summa that we're going to be talking about that prove our case. Because they always say, you don't cite Thomas, you don't cite Thomas Aquinas himself, you just cite a bunch of secondary people. I've been citing Thomas for 10 years, dummies. I got essays on my site from 10 years ago listing all the sections in the Summa, like that one I just posted for you. You don't cite the Thomas himself. Have we have a challenger here? How do you sign up for my YouTube stuff? Uh, you go to Jay's Analysis and you can become a member at the website and you get access to all the archives, all the lectures, hundreds and hundreds of posts over the last, I don't know, long time. Uh, if you want to become a member at the website, there are advantages to doing it that way. You get immediate access to all of the archives. So I'll put the link right now into the chat. This is the link for how you subscribe to Jay's Analysis. You join there and you get access to all the back archives for the last several years of the audio and video content. So you can be a uh, gold or silver member. Uh, silver is $4.95 for one month. Gold is $60 for a whole year. Um, if you want to, you can also uh, subscribe at, on my YouTube channel. There's the join button there, but you have to be on a PC. The join button isn't on uh, phones. So if you get to a PC, you can join uh, the channel directly and then you get access to, but the way, but since I just got the join button, what I'm having to do for the last month is, or it's only been two or three weeks, um, basically in the community tab, the social media section tab on YouTube, I'm posting each day, um, going, working my way back the first half and then the subscribers half in the community tabs. So you can access those there. Um, but the problem is that I can't, post every one of because we got like hundreds of videos going back for years of subscriber content so i'm having to do it like a day at a time um, but the advantage is that if you want to do it a little bit cheaper you can do it on youtube that way it's a little bit cheap that's the cheapest way to do it but you don't get access to the full archives 
uh, if you subscribe to the website, you get immediate access to old archives. So that's how that works. Thoughts on Machiavellianism? Um, I have long essays on Machiavelli. You can read those at Jay's analysis. Uh, let's see. Did we get one more super chat? Nope, doesn't look like it. All right. So, yeah, uh, you can subscribe at the website. You can subscribe also on Patreon. I've been doing tutoring. We had a lot of tutoring this last month. A lot of new people. Uh, I do direct philosophy tutoring. And... Um, so that's going good. And you can buy the two books, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2, at Jay's Analysis. I will leave that link as well because we got boomers in the audience and they need direct links because they don't know how to click around. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking, boomers. I love you. I love all you boomers. But that's our philosophic critique um, of the five ways at the present and comparing it to the methodology and mind of the Eastern Fathers. Obviously, it's different. That's the shop where you can purchase the books. Sign copies if you get the books directly from me and not from Amazon. Uh, I've got hundreds of five-star reviews on the book. They're really, the books, they're both good. So avail yourselves of those. There's a lot of philosophy. It's shot not just movies. A lot of philosophies in there. A lot of worldview critiques through analyzing film. It's a very unique approach in those two books. Uh, thank you for all your Super Chat supports. So much love, guys. Uh, again, you can join on the join button there on the channel or in the members subscribe section and the members uh, half of this chat will be up in the next few days when we'll go point by point through Aquinas we'll go through uh, Ambiguum 7 and we'll go through Ambiguum 15 specifically pointing out the differences in these two approaches uh, and we'll also go through the five ways explicitly thank you guys uh, good times tonight God bless Pray for the conversion of the Thomists. Uh, pray that uh, we come to be on the same team. We should be on the same team, not having to fight each other all the time. I don't want to fight Thomas. I want to be on the same team. But remember, their team is defending Frank. The guy that they're ultimately lawyers for is the guy who hates them. They need to see that we aren't their enemies. Frank is their enemy, and Frank don't want them. So they can keep defending an enemy of Christ all they want, but eventually they're going to have to wise up and realize that we are the church, not Frank. <laughs>